Hello and welcome to today's webinar, How Do Households Describe Where They Live? I'm Sean Buckles, Head Statistical Officer and Director of Housing and Demographic Analysis at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, also known as HUD. I'm your host for today's presentation. In 2017, we added a question into the American Housing Survey asking respondents if they would describe their neighborhood as urban, suburban, or rural. In today's presentation, we will explore this topic in more detail, and we hope to accomplish four goals. First, we will share with you HUD's motivations for adding this neighborhood description question to the American Housing Survey. Second, we will review some of the 2017 national results, and we will compare those results to two other surveys that ask the same question. Third, we will demonstrate one use of the neighborhood description question, which is to compare how federal definitions of urban and rural align with how people describe their neighborhood. And we will describe a data product we created to facilitate those types of comparisons. And fourth, we will introduce another data product we recently developed called the Urbanization Perceptions Small Area Index, or UPSAI. The data product uses neighborhood description data to produce an improved nationwide area urbanization classification based on people's description of their neighborhood. After the, after the prepared presentation, I will be back to lead a panel discussion about the neighborhood description question and the two data products we've created from the neighborhood description data. For that discussion, I will be joined by two special guests, Emily Molfino from the US Census Bureau and Jed Kolkel from Indeed. And finally, after the panel discussion, we will take your questions. Before we get started with a special prepared presentation, a reminder, during our discussion or at any point during this webinar, feel free to post your questions in the question box at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end. Now, please listen to this prepared presentation and I will be back shortly. What is the American Housing Survey? The American Housing Survey is the nation's most comprehensive housing survey. The Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, funds and provides oversight for the survey. The U.S. Census Bureau, or Census, collects the data. The American Housing Survey has provided current and continuous data on the U.S. housing stock and the people who occupy America's households since 1973. These days, the American Housing Survey is conducted every two years, we recently finished the 2019 data collection period, and we are looking forward to conducting the next American Housing Survey in 2021. HUD uses American Housing Survey data to examine issues that are critical to advancing our mission, improving our effectiveness, and designing housing programs that meet the needs of different target groups, including first-time homebuyers and older Americans. Policy analysts, program managers, and budget analysts in federal, state, and local governments use American Housing Survey data to monitor housing supply and demand, as well as changes in housing conditions and costs. Private organizations, including trade associations, use American Housing Survey data to study issues important to our member communities. Finally, academic researchers at our nation's universities and think tanks use the American Housing Survey data to gain a deeper understanding of housing policy issues, including housing affordability for low-income renters. The American Housing Survey provides current information on a wide range of core housing topics. Core housing topics are included in every survey and include the size and composition of the nation's housing inventory, vacancies, heating and cooking fuel usage, the physical condition of housing units, characteristics of occupants, equipment breakdowns, home improvements, mortgages and other housing costs, persons living in or eligible for assisted housing, home values, and characteristics of recent movers. In addition to the core topics, the American Housing Survey includes a series of rotating topical modules that collect data on a wide variety of housing-related topics of special interest to HUD and the American Housing Survey user community. These rotating modules provide unique insights on topics like health and safety hazards in the home, food insecurity, the use of housing counseling services, the presence of arts and cultural opportunities in the community, 
neighborhood characteristics, delinquent rent or mortgage payments, and emergency and disaster preparedness, among others. The American Housing Survey is a nationwide survey that is designed to produce national estimates, estimates for 25 large metropolitan areas, and estimates for certain states. You can find more information on the American Housing Survey, including several tutorial videos and documents on how to use tools like the American Housing Survey Table Creator and Codebook online at census.gov slash programs dash surveys slash AHS. Now for today's topic, how do households describe where they live? In 2017, HUD added a neighborhood description question to the 2017 American Housing Survey asking respondents whether they would describe their neighborhood as urban, suburban, or rural. Before we explore the findings, it is important to understand some of HUD's motivations for including this neighborhood description question in the 2017 AHS. HUD had four principal reasons for adding this question. First, HUD wanted to replicate the main findings of a survey conducted by the real estate company Trulia, where they asked neighborhood description questions. HUD felt that Trulia's results were important. Second, HUD sought to provide empirical evidence showing how existing federal definitions of urban and rural align with people's description of their neighborhood. Definitions of urban and rural play an important role in how HUD and several other agencies within the federal government allocate tax dollars. The federal government has long had an interest in this issue. Third, HUD wanted to understand the extent to which existing federal definitions of urban and rural obscure the stylized fact that half of Americans live in a suburban setting. Most existing federal definitions of urban and rural do not include a suburban category. However, data from the American Housing Survey show that more than half of the homes in the U.S. are, in fact, single-family homes surrounded by other single-family homes a feature often associated with a suburban setting. Finally, HUD wanted to provide data to help inform discussions around the next generation of federal definitions, including the Census Bureau's 2020 Urban Areas and the Office of Management and Budget, or OMB's 2023 Metropolitan Statistical Areas. Now that you have some background, let's look at some results from the 2017 American Housing Survey Neighborhood Description Study. Let's start by looking at the national results. According to the 2017 American Housing Survey, 27% of households describe their neighborhood as urban, 52% describe their neighborhood as suburban, and 21% describe their neighborhood as rural. The middle number, 52%, shows that more than half of American households describe their neighborhood as suburban. It confirms what many demographic and housing researchers have long believed, that half of Americans live in the suburbs. To give some additional context to these results, let's compare them to two other non-governmental surveys. First, we compare the AHS results to those from Trulia, which, as previously mentioned, was the catalyst for some of HUD's latest efforts on this topic. Trulia is an American home and neighborhood site that helps buyers and renters find homes and neighborhoods across the United States. Trulia provides recommendations, local insights, and map overlays that offer details on a commute, reported crime, schools, churches, and nearby businesses. Data from Trulia's 2015 survey of how households describe their neighborhoods show that 26% say their neighborhood is urban, 51% say their neighborhood is suburban, and 23% describe it as rural. This finding is almost identical to the 2017 American Housing Survey's findings. Next, let's compare the AHS results to those from the Pew Research Center. In 2017, the Pew Research Center conducted a survey of 5,000 households, asking each household to describe their neighborhood as urban, suburban, or rural. The Pew survey revealed that 43% of households in the U.S. described their neighborhood as suburban while 25% described their neighborhood as urban and 30% described their neighborhood as rural. The next question we wanted to explore was how American Housing Survey respondents' descriptions of their neighborhood aligned with federal definitions of urban and rural. 
We can compare respondents' descriptions of their neighborhood to various federal definitions of urban and rural because we can know the exact address of the American Housing Survey respondents. First, let's compare the popular census urban areas definition with how people describe their neighborhoods. In the first column, you see the definitions, including the census urban area categories, urbanized area, urban clusters, and rural. Urbanized areas are urban areas with more than 50,000 people. Urban clusters are urban areas with between 2,500 and 50,000 people. Rural is any area outside of urbanized areas or urban clusters. Of the households living in census urbanized areas, 95% describe their neighborhood as either urban or suburban, and 5% describe their neighborhood as rural. For households in areas that the Census Bureau defines as rural, just under 80% describe their neighborhood as rural. These two data points suggest that the Census Bureau's urban area framework for differentiating between urban and rural aligns with how people describe their neighborhood. Now, let's look at the table that uses the OMB's metropolitan areas definition to show how people describe their neighborhoods. OMB makes it very clear that their metropolitan areas definition is not meant to be used to distinguish between urban or rural. However, it is used widely for that very purpose. As in the prior table, the first column contains the federal definition, which is metropolitan area categories, metropolitan areas, micropolitan areas, and areas outside of metros or micros. For all the households living in metropolitan areas, 86% describe their neighborhood as urban or suburban, and 14% describe their neighborhood as rural. This table tells a very similar story to the last table. A large majority of households living in metropolitan areas, 86%, describe their neighborhood as either urban or suburban, while a large share of households, 72%, living outside of metropolitan or micropolitan areas describe their neighborhood as rural. The takeaway from this table is that the metropolitan areas definition also does a good job of distinguishing urban and suburban areas from rural ones. The two tables we just presented are part of a larger set of tables that HUD has produced comparing various definitions of urban, suburban, and rural to respondents' descriptions of their neighborhood. We call this data product the American Housing Survey Neighborhood Study Summary Tables. This data product is a Microsoft Excel workbook containing 23 tables, similar to what we have just shown you. You can find the workbook on HUDUser.gov in a section we've dedicated to the 2017 AHS Neighborhood Description Study. Just go to the second tab and click on the Summary Tables download link. Once you download the Microsoft Excel workbook, you will see 23 tables. Let's take a look at one of the tables now. Here on Table 1, you see the national data we described earlier. As we look further, we see the data is split into additional characteristics, including census divisions, beginning at Table 6, and metropolitan areas, beginning at Table 13. Now, let's turn our attention to another data product we created called the Urbanization Perception Small Area Index. As previously mentioned, both Trulia and the Pew Research Center included a neighborhood description question in their respective surveys and produced tables showing their survey results. Both Trulia and Pew also used their survey data to create a classification model and then used the model to classify all the zip codes area in the U.S. as urban, suburban, or rural. Motivated by Trulia's and Pew's prior work creating their small area urbanization classification products, we developed what we feel is an improved nationwide small area urbanization classification product based on people's description of their neighborhood called the UPSAI. To create the UPSAI, we developed a classification model that predicts how households would describe their neighborhood given characteristics of the region and neighborhood. We ran the model using a machine learning algorithm, Random Forest, that produced an AHS-based classifier. We then applied the classifier to track level aggregate regional and neighborhood measures in the American Community Survey, also known as ACS. 
we created a predicted likelihood that the average ACS household in the tract would describe their neighborhood as urban, suburban, and rural. Finally, we used the predictions to classify each census tract as urban, suburban, or rural. The map of the New York City metropolitan area gives you a taste of what the UPSAI data product looks like. The areas shaded in dark red are census tracts, where we predict the majority of households would describe their neighborhood as urban. The areas in pink are census tracts, where we predict the majority of households would describe their neighborhood as suburban. Here, we present the same type of map, but for the Detroit, Michigan metropolitan area. Again, the areas shaded in dark red are census tracts where we predict the majority of households would describe their neighborhood as urban, while the areas shaded in pink are census tracts where we predict the majority of households would describe their neighborhood as suburban. We hypothesize that our UPSAI tract level product is an improvement over both Trulia's and Pew's nationwide small area urbanization classification product for two reasons. First, the 2017 American Housing Survey national sample size of 55,000 is much larger than Pew's sample size of 5,000 and Trulia's sample size of 2,000. This larger sample size, combined with machine learning algorithms, allowed us to uncover more complex patterns in the data. Second, the 2017 AHS data include more precise housing unit location information, the exact address. In comparison, Trulia and Pew's original surveys used zip code data. More precise location information provided by the exact address allows us to produce a final product that is more geographically precise. You can access the UPSAI product on the AHS Neighborhood Description Study webpage on HUDUser.gov by selecting the Urban Perceptions Small Area Index tab and downloading the data file. The UPSAI data product has also been turned into a GIS layer that you can download from our website. Finally, for those who are interested in learning more about the UPSAI, we have published a working paper titled The Urbanization Perception Small Area Index, an application of machine learning and small area estimation to household survey data. It can also be found on the 2017 AHS Neighborhood Description Study website under the Urbanization Perception Small Area Index tab. Thank you for listening to this brief overview of the 2017 American Housing Survey's Neighborhood Description Study. Now, back to your host, Mr. Sean Buckholtz. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed that special presentation on neighborhood description data in the 2017 American Housing Survey. If you're just joining us, I am Sean Buckholtz, Head Statistical Officer and Director of Housing and Demographic Analysis at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and I am your host for today's presentation. As a reminder, you may continue to post your questions in the questions box at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end. As I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, one of our goals was to compare how federal definitions of urban and rural align with how people describe their neighborhood and to describe a data product we created to, fil to facilitate those types of comparisons. A second goal I mentioned was to introduce another data product we recently developed called the Urbanization Perceptions Small Area Index, or UPSAI. To help me further achieve both of those goals, I'm joined by two colleagues. I'd like to welcome Jed Kolkel, Chief Economist at Indeed. Thanks for joining, Jed. Thanks very much, Sean. I would also like to welcome Emily Molfino, Survey Statistician at the U.S. Census Bureau. Thanks for joining, Emily. Hi, glad to be here. Jed, I'd like to begin with some questions for you. So back in 2015, when you were with Trulia, you and your colleagues ran a survey asking a few thousand Americans how they would describe their neighborhood. What was the motivation for that survey question? So in 2015, there were um, two issues that motivated uh, the desire to understand better how people perceive and describe their neighborhoods. Um, one was very much about the housing market. Uh, 2015, um, we had just, of course, gone through many years of a housing bust. 
um, after a boom um, and then a recovery um, that had very different effects uh, in urban neighborhoods and suburban neighborhoods. Uh, we could see this in construction rates, we could see it in home prices, we could see it in other measures as well. Um, at Trulia, we were looking at lots of measures at a very granular level to try to understand um, how urban and suburban neighborhoods were going through the cycle differently. Um, but there was no official definition or official classification uh, for uh, grouping neighborhoods into those two categories. So there was a research purpose for understanding different housing dynamics. Um, but uh, more broadly, um, there's long been a confusion um, when you talk to people about what urban means. Um, sometimes people use urban um, in contrast to rural, uh, such as when people say that uh, globally, the world is becoming more urban. Um, at the same time, um, people talk about urban in contrast to the suburbs. Um, and in recent years in the US, uh, the population has been growing faster in the suburbs than in urban areas. So in one sense, it's both right to say that the world is becoming more urban and the US is becoming less urban. Um, because there are two different definitions running around. Uh, and since this is so important, we wanted to ask how people perceive their neighborhoods. It turned out to be a single question, asking people urban, suburban, or rural, um, out of which we then uh, were able to uh, do this analysis and this classification. Um, and it was a, an awful lot of output and insight uh, from uh, a very small amount of survey space um, in a survey we were already running. All right, thanks, uh, thanks for that uh, answer, very interesting. So the Trulia survey showed a little over half of Americans described their neighborhood as suburban. Did that result surprise you? So that 50% was about uh, what I would have guessed. Uh, I'm not sure if you, if you had told me beforehand to write it down and seal it in an envelope, um, exactly what I would have guessed, probably somewhere between 40 and 70%. Um, but the 50% the uh, sort of seemed in line um, with my own perceptions of how people talked about their neighborhoods. Um, you know, the, the types of places where people insist their neighborhoods are urban, um, places where people prefer to describe them as suburban. Um, so the 50% was you know, in, in line with um, a, a, a wide range of guesses I might have had. Great. So you and I collaborated on putting the neighborhood description question into the American Housing Survey in 2017. One product we've created from the American Housing Survey uh, neighborhood description data is a series of tables showing how people's descriptions of their neighborhood compare to various federal definitions of urban and rural. I'm going to show you a table from that series of tables. Uh, that shows the share of people in metropolitan areas describing their neighborhood as urban, suburban, and rural. It also breaks that down by uh, central cities of metropolitan areas and areas outside of the central cities. Uh, what, it, uh, I'm sorry, can we go back to the, um, Sorry, we're having a little slide difficulty. There we go. Okay, so Jed, looking at this, uh, this table, what, if anything, surprises you about this table? So I think the most striking thing about this table uh, is the, the central cities line, um, that only 51% of people who live in central cities uh, describe their neighborhood as urban. Uh, often when uh, researchers uh, attempt to compare cities and their suburbs, uh, based on existing publicly available data, um, they rely on this central city versus outside central city distinction um, as the way of separating urban from suburban. Um, and this table shows um, how much you actually miss by doing that, um, that uh, nearly half of respondents in central cities uh, would perceive their neighborhood to be suburban um, and uh, a, a tiny share even uh, would describe their neighborhood as rural. Yep, that was uh, that was a conclusion that I reached as well. I was uh, equally surprised by by this table. All right, so another table I want to show you from our series of tables. Uh, this table shows the share of households describing their neighborhood as urban, suburban, or rural, 
but for each of the five largest metropolitan areas in the US. Those are New York City, Los Angeles, uh, Chicago, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, and Houston. Uh, Jed, what if anything uh, jumps out at you in this table? So uh, my two favorite parts of this table are uh, the first two lines. So first of all, um, that um, Metro New York, um, as, as you know, strongly associated with all things urban New York is, um, a majority of the New York metro area uh, describes their neighborhood um, as something other than urban. 49% um, suburban and 4% rural. Um, the other, but my, my single favorite piece of this, so I'm, I'm now a Californian, even though I started out as a New Yorker, um, Los Angeles gets a really bad rap um, for uh, being criticized as the poster child for sprawl. Um, in fact, um, Angelinos are almost as likely to describe their neighborhood as urban as Metro New Yorkers are, um, and less likely to describe their neighborhood as rural um, than any of these other large metros. Um, this is confirmed when we look at uh, density at the tract level um, across different metros. Uh, people in the LA metro are less likely to live at very low density um, than people in any other large metro. Uh, so if the, the one takeaway from here um, is uh, if you want to have uh, in your mind um, an example uh, of a metro area that is mostly suburban, um, Los Angeles uh, is not the one you should have in mind. Great, that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, take on that table. So one more table from the series of tables that we created. Uh, so first for the webinar participants, I wanna point out that this table that we're showing you is structured a bit differently from the prior two tables. In this table, all the percent values add up to 100. So for instance, 24% of all households are in metropolitan areas and describe their neighborhood as urban. So Jed, what if anything jumps out to you in this table? To me, the most striking thing about this table is uh, that um, a majority of people who describe their neighborhood as rural um, live in metropolitan areas. Uh, and the, uh, the vast majority of people who describe their neighborhood as rural live in either metropolitan or micropolitan areas. Uh, these areas cover so much of the US because they're county based, they encompass uh, lots of rural portions uh, of counties that get defined as part of metro and micro areas. Um, most of us, myself included, um, are guilty um, when talking casually uh, of equating um, outside of metro area with rural. Um, but uh, it shows very clearly that um, most people who think of themselves as living in rural neighborhoods um, are in fact in metropolitan areas. Yep, I thought uh, something similar. This is a, a very interesting table. All right, Jed, uh, thanks for your insights. And Emily, I'd now like to ask you a few questions. Great. So the new product that you, Jed, and I created is called the Urbanization Perception Small Area Index. In the prepared portion of our presentation, we briefly mentioned our main motivation. Uh, so can you expand upon our motivations for creating this product? Yeah. Well, our main motivation was that we wanted to classify small areas as urban, suburban, or rural. Now, as explained, Jed and his Trulia colleagues had already created a similar data product using their server data. And we noticed there was a big demand for this type of data product. We then saw an opportunity to build upon what Jed had done with the American Housing Survey's larger sample size, so we wanted to build the next generation product. Okay, so we built this next generation product. Uh, why did we have to use this complicated machine learning technique to make our small areas index? A good question. Um, well, first, we had to rely on a small area esti estimate approach as the American Housing Survey sample is too small to produce reliable estimates for small areas. On the other hand, the Census Bureau's American Community Survey has enough sample in each of the census tracts to create reliable estimates. So we were able to leverage both. 
We then relied on machine learning to create these small area estimates due to both the data and the complexity behind what makes an area urban, suburban, and rural. Machine learning classifiers require less strenuous assumptions than more traditional models like multinomial logistic regression and can handle variables that are collinear. Great, so I think it's fair to say we didn't use machine learning just as a marketing ploy. We actually <laughs> use machine learning to improve our product, right? For sure, yes. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm gonna put up a slide that shows the five general steps in our modeling process. So can you take us through uh, each step? Yeah, well, the, the first three steps are really decisions we had to make. Uh, so first, we had to choose which explanatory variables we were going to use. We wanted to build upon previous efforts, and the common thread of variables used in those efforts were variables such as population or housing unit density, uh, population size of an area, and population movement like commuting. We also wanted to add a few more based on theories we had as well. So we ended up with 21 neighborhood level variables and two regional level variables. The next decision was how to define a neighborhood. The American Housing Survey question asked respondents to describe their neighborhood, but doesn't describe what a neighborhood is for them. It is left up to, do, to the respondent. Um, so we ultimately chose to use the census tract due to its smaller size that are based off housing unit counts. And third, we chose to use a random forest classifier over other algorithms, as it would help mitigate some problems seen with overfitting and noisy data. Once those decisions were made, uh, the overall process to create the index was actually quite straightforward. Uh, we trained a model based on data from the American Housing Survey and estimates from other data sources. This trained model was then used to predict whether a tract is urban and suburban or rural. All right, so we went through a number of steps, a uh, uh, number of complicated steps and some decisions we had to make. So what would you say was the hardest part of using the machine learning technique to, to create our product? Yeah, well, as with any data science endeavor, uh, piecing the data together wasn't easy. We pulled together several data sources for this project. We use demographic and socioeconomic data from the American Community Survey. We used business and employment data from the census and a data vendor called Dun & Bradstreet. We also pulled in the locations of skyscrapers from an organization called the Skyscraper Center. After pulling the data together, uh, the machine really does all the work, hence the name machine learning. Uh, but I did keep an eye on making sure that it was generalizable and produced accurate predictions. Great. So I'm now going to show you a table of what's called feature importance scores or model importance scores, it, which this table tells us some interesting information about our machine learning model. Uh, model. Uh, can you explain what we're seeing here? Yes. Uh, so feature importance is a useful way to understand what features or explanatory variables are helping the classifier more by providing more information. So this table shows the top six uh, important features in our model. So important here is not the actual score, but the relative order and magnitude of them. So unsurprisingly, uh, population and housing unit density matters, as does the absolute population of the size of the place. Now there were some surprises. We went through a lot of data work to use this skyscrapers data in our model. And we were certain that the presence of a building over 185 feet in a neighborhood would influence how people describe their neighborhood. Uh, but it turned out that the presence of skyscrapers in your neighborhood was actually not that all important in conjunction with the other variables. So that was interesting. Yeah, and I, I think another interesting um, uh, conclusion from this table is uh, that population uh, density, housing unit density, and place population are all uh, very important predictors of how people describe their neighborhoods. And those happen to be 
the, uh, the characteristics that uh, form the foundation of the Census Bureau's urban areas. So this, uh, I think, um, validates uh, the approach of the Census Bureau when they're building uh, their urban areas uh, product. All right, I'm now gonna show you a snippet of what our final uh, UPSAI data set looks like. It, can you explain to potential users what they are seeing in this, uh, in this slide? Yeah, so I am really excited about how the final data product is re easily accessible to data users no matter their experience. So in the data, each row is a census tract and each tract has the estimated number of households and the final category. We also included the probability of the tract being in each of the categories, which is created by our classifier. So in the first, table, in the uh, in the first row in the table shown, the final category is urban. But another way to see it is that that tract has a 75% probability of being urban. More advanced data users would note that our classifier is biased towards predicting suburban areas as it is the most common area. Thus, the 60% difference is quite large. In fact, over half of the tracks nationwide are predicted with over 80% probability, which is great. Um, this format is flexible in that it allows users to aggregate our product to most any geographic area, such as county or congressional district. And it also allows more advanced data users to control the level of classifier confidence. So it is very flexible. Great, and so um, another question on this. So do you think a natural interpretation of, of let's say that 75% number is to say that we predict that 75% of the households in this census tract would describe their neighborhood as urban? Um, I, would, I wouldn't go that far because this result is based off the average, okay. um, but I would just keep it at the, the, the tract level estimate. Okay. Um, that, uh, so in this, in this example, there's a 10% probability that someone in that tract would say, rural, which is quite low. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Emily, for those answers. Uh, I want to finish up with a few more questions for Jed. Jed, so you, Emily, and I have collaborated to create this new urbanization perception small area index. What, are you, what do you think are some of the uses for this data product? So naturally, uh, some of the great uses are combining uh, these track level classifications um, with track level data uh, from the ACS and other track level sources uh, in order to start doing real comparisons to understand uh, how urban and suburban areas uh, differ, um, both at the national level uh, and also uh, for individual, individual metropolitan areas. Um, there are some parts of the country where uh, there are very big disparities in income, diversity and so on between urban and suburban areas. Um, other metropolitan areas, other regions of the country um, where those urban suburban differences uh, aren't so big. Um, and so I think that's one uh, great use of these kinds of data. Um, we've also um, made it such that it's very easy to roll up the tracked classifications into county and higher level geographic averages. Um, that's incredibly useful because so much of the critical uh, and high frequency data um, that we want to use um, may not be available at the track level, but is available at the county level. Uh, so if we want to compare, for instance, um, what's going on uh, with unemployment rates in urban versus suburban areas, uh, one can combine BLS monthly unemployment rates uh, with our estimates of how urban, suburban, or rural uh, counties are on average um, to see uh, what's going on uh, urban versus suburban rural um, with unemployment and lots of other county level data. So great. Uh, so taking this kind of back to its uh, back to its genesis, uh, you commented earlier about how federal definitions of uh, urban suburban 
are missing this third category of suburban and how that was a, a motivation for the original truly a survey question. So right now, federal experts are planning for the next uh, versions of, the, of both the Census Bureau's urban areas, as well as the uh, Office of Management and Budget's metropolitan areas, and other uh, urban and rural definitions that, use t that will use 2020 decennial data. So given these activities, what advice would you give to those federal experts as they consider updates to these definitions? I think for the urban area definitions, um, this opens the possibility uh, of actually creating um, a separate category uh, of suburban um, because those urban area definitions uh, are built off um, more granular geography. Um, and that would be an incredibly useful lens through, through which to see all kinds of data. Um, for metropolitan areas, um, you know, they're of course uh, built up from counties, um, but uh, the insights on how urban or suburban a county is um, could inform uh, the additional information um, that people often use for counties within metro areas to identify um, which are the most uh, central counties within metropolitan areas, um, as opposed to just relying on which ones contain principal cities. Um, the other uh, very important use um, is that these are definitions, this urban, suburban, rural uh, classification is something that can help us compare metropolitan areas. Um, some metropolitan areas um, are much more urban than others. Um, some metropolitan areas uh, have significant rural portions. Uh, and so um, there may be um, ways in, um, ways that the urbanness uh, of a county um, could even become part of uh, how we define the boundaries uh, of metropolitan areas and other uh, county or higher level designations. Great, all right. Uh, thanks, uh, Jed and Emily. And so now we're gonna move to the last part of our webinar here, which is to take some questions from the audience. Uh, and as a reminder, uh, feel free to post your questions in the question box at the bottom of your screen. And I've been monitoring the Q&A and I see some uh, uh, great questions coming in. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, take, I'll take the first one myself, which is, uh, is there a variable for urban, suburban, or rural in the, in the 2017 public use file? And unfortunately, the answer to that is no. Uh, we have uh, limitations on the information we can put in the public use file due to disclosure uh, avoidance. So the variable itself is only available in the internal use file. Uh, and if you're interested in doing more work with, uh, with this data, um, you can apply to uh, use the internal use data uh, through a Census Bureau uh, research data center. Okay, so uh, next question. Uh, can the neighborhood description variable from 2017 be applied to the housing units in the 2015 AHS national and metropolitan uh, area samples? Uh, the short answer is yes. The, the, this question was administered to the 2017 uh, integrated national sample, which includes cases from the, uh, both the national sample and the largest 15 metropolitan areas. Uh, those cases are longitudinal, meaning almost all of them were also in the 2015 uh, American Housing Survey. Uh, now, um, a cautionary uh, uh, tale there is that some housing or some households uh, move in and out of housing units. And so uh, for households, uh, for housing units that have a different household in 2015, uh, the answer uh, may, may not apply. Um, but I think it, it could be done. And uh, again, this would be have, uh, have to be something that was done with the uh, internal use data. Okay, next question. Uh, did you do some kind of comparison of the qualitative descriptors, uh, descriptors with the quantitative household density of each census tract? Um, and so, so great question. Uh, so first, the, the type of model that we ran uh, did not um, give us the ability to, to produce 
a short set of decision rules that would say, for instance, households or, or um, I'm sorry, census tracts with more than, you know, 1,500 people per square mile are urban and between, you know, 300 and 1,500 are urban. Uh, we, we could not do that with the output of our model. However, in our uh, paper, we do present some, uh, some comparisons of the qualitative descriptors with some quantitative uh, uh, measures showing that, for instance, what was the median household density for, for tracts that were urban, for tracts that were suburban, and for tracts that were rural. So you'd have to look at the paper to get uh, some more insight into that. Uh, next question. Um, single family zoning seems to be a defining characteristic of the suburbs. As more places do away with exclusionary zoning, how might this impact how people describe their neighbor, uh, neighborhoods? And how much, of, how much of this, and this meaning zoning, uh, contributes to how uh, people describe their neighborhoods? Uh, Jed, um, do you think, uh, I'm gonna throw that question to you, do you think, uh, how do you think zoning makes its way through into how people describe their neighborhoods? I think the one way in which zoning makes its way through to neighborhood perceptions and descriptions um, is that zoning uh, affects uh, the nature of the housing stock, how much of the housing stock is single family, detached uh, or multi-unit. I think this question though of how uh, zoning changes um, and other kinds of changes that neighborhoods might experience um, will affect perception uh, is fascinating. Um, it could be that um, if there are systematic changes in neighborhoods, for instance, um, uh, uh, higher density construction in suburban neighborhoods, um, it's possible um, that people in those neighborhoods might perceive, increasingly perceive their neighborhoods to be more urban than they used to. Um, or it could be that the way people perceive density could shift um, and uh, people uh, hang on to how they originally perceived their neighborhood. Um, it's just that they have a broader definition of suburban in their mind that encompasses more density. Um, we can't know um, until we uh, ask this question again after the world has changed, um, whether it's um, people's perception of their neighborhood uh, that might evolve or uh, people's perception of what urban, suburban, and rural mean. All right, thanks, Jed. Uh, next question, and Emily, I'm gonna uh, direct this question to you. Mm -hmm. Aside from skyscrapers, uh, did the model consider residential structure type, for instance, detached versus attached housing? Uh, yes, we did. And I'm trying to pull up the list of, because there's a lot. So we looked at, included in the model, is the share of housing units that are single family detached. Uh, so we did include that. And that ended up for the final model for feature importance right in the middle. So it wasn't the most important, it wasn't the least important, just right there in the middle of the share that are single family detached in, in the tract. Great, and uh, a similar question for you, Emily. Um, so, it, was the business density and employment density uh, data from Dun and Bradstreet, and for the employment density, might the um, open access, the LEHD loads data, be more helpful for most users for employment density? Well, we did include the 2015 loads data in the model, so we both we both include the employment density and the employee density. And some might say, but those are collinear. Uh, but yes, what's nice about uh, random forest and machine learning is that doesn't matter. The model can still pick out information from them. Uh, so we included both. And uh, another uh, uh, similar question to that, I'll, I'll direct this one to you, Emily, again. Uh, in the same location, say like a central city, uh, did responses for urban, suburban, rural vary between different demographics or between different levels of household income? Yes. So um, we found that especially household income um, was an important feature in the model. And if you look at the, the final results and looking at the medium household income, 
by, um, broken down by whether it's urban, suburban, and rural, we find that suburban areas have on, on average, on median, um, a higher median income than urban, area, uh, than urban areas and rural areas have a higher median income than uh, urban areas, which was interesting. And then we also looked at, um, including the model, share of the population that are non-Hispanic Black. Um, and in that case, uh, urban tracts are more, uh, have a higher share of non-Hispanic Blacks than suburban or rural by a lot. Um, there wasn't really anything seen with a uh, share of non-Hispanic Asian other than uh, it very, it, there's low uh, shares of non-Hispanic Asian in rural areas. Um, we also looked at age um, and uh, potentially unsurprisingly, rural areas have more people over the age of 55 than urban areas. Um, and the other and urban areas are more likely to have people 25 to 39. So we included these share of population uh, estimates in our model. And you can okay. reference the paper to see some of these breakdowns. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Um, next question, and I'm gonna take this one. Uh, a user found a tract in Baltimore with a uh, UPSAI urban score of 0.499 and a suburban score of 0 0.500 or 501, meaning it's right on the edge. Uh, but we classified it as urban. Uh, what were the cutoff, what cutoff scores were used? So that's a, um, a detail we, we didn't address in uh, the presentation. Uh, or our Q&A session, uh, but this is addressed in the paper. And that is that for our final product, our UPSAI product, um, after we uh, ran the model and came up with these uh, uh, scores, we then uh, controlled the total number of tracks that were uh, categorized as urban and suburban and rural and we controlled that based on the national level results we found from the American Housing Survey. So for instance, our, the American Housing Survey, 52% uh, of households describe their neighborhoods as suburban. And so we made sure that our final, uh, our final track based product, that 52% of the tracks would be uh, categorized as suburban, of course, weighted by uh, households. So that's why you might see for some tracks where, for instance, the suburban score is slightly higher than the urban score, but the track is still classified as urban. Okay, uh, so I, I have another question here. I wanna direct this one to, uh, to, to Jed. Um, even though I, I, I probably should answer, answer this, but I would like to hear uh, uh, Jed's uh, opinion on this. Uh, will the neighborhood study question be included in future American housing surveys? So I'll pose to Jed, do you think we should include a neighborhood uh, description question in future uh, American housing surveys? And if so, why? Uh, I would love to see that same question included uh, in future surveys. Um, and I think uh, the, Biggest reason for that is uh, to see whether perceptions are changing over time. Um, if perceptions weren't changing over time, um, then even if neighborhoods changed, it would be possible to run neighborhood characteristics through a model um, to apply the same model um, to what neighborhoods might look like in the future. Um, but if perceptions change, um, if for instance, um, uh, suburbs increasingly uh, get more racially and ethnically diverse. Uh, and so um, people perceive um, the effects of uh, demographics uh, differently when it comes to urban, urban suburban, rural definitions. Um, we would need to ask this question again um, and run a similar model um, to see uh, how the factors uh, load differently um, and whether um, the, a neighborhood with the same characteristics might end up being classified differently over time if perceptions change. So 
I hope so. Unfortunately, um, you're the one who can tell us whether that's possible. Well, I think it's a good idea and definitely uh, uh, worth uh, considering. Give me something to, to think about uh, uh, going forward, especially our next uh, American Housing Survey will be the 2021 American Housing Survey. And uh, uh, there's a possibility of, of repeating that question. Um, Jed, uh, another question that I'm going to direct your way. Uh, you hit on this a little bit in the, uh, in the Q&A session, uh, and perhaps you could expand upon it a little bit more. Um, the question is, does the Census Bureau have a separate definition for urban and suburban? And uh, perhaps in your answer, you could um, describe some ways in which people have used uh, census data to make, a, to, to make their own suburban definition. Yeah, so unless, unless something changed, uh, you know, in the, in the last few days that I'm not aware of, um, no, there is no official uh, census definition or concept. Uh, of suburban as opposed to urban. Um, and as a result, um, lots of people, um, including myself, have uh, tried over the years uh, different ways to uh, come up with definitions that proxy for suburban. Um, again, one common one that people use, um, often because it's the only uh, option, um, is to uh, look at central city versus outside of central city. Um, within uh, a metropolitan area. Um, people also sometimes look at uh, a principal city or largest city by jurisdiction um, compared to uh, the rest of a county or metropolitan area or state. Um, but you know, as, as you can see, if you start digging, um, there are uh, often um, tracks that might lie outside a large city um, that are in fact classified as more urban um, then some tracks that may uh, res uh, lie within a big city boundary. Um, and so uh, a, a third way that um, people have sometimes tried to get around uh, the absence of a definition um, is to classify counties um, as uh, primarily urban, suburban, or rural, uh, especially useful in trying to combine a classification like that um, with data that's only available uh, at the county level. Um, typically, um, those are based uh, on density by itself um, or on um, uh, a central versus non-central county designation within a metro, um, and sometimes just eyeballing, um, sometimes assigning uh, the densest county in the metro as uh, the central one and all others uh, as effectively the suburbs. Obviously, these are all crude and arbitrary ways uh, of defining uh, the suburbs, um, none of which should be necessary again, um, now that we have this tract level classification. Great. Um, uh, just a couple more questions I'm going to answer uh, really quickly before we hit the two o'clock hour. Uh, we had a question, how did the model perform in terms of accuracy, precision, and recall? And in our uh, working paper, we, uh, we we describe how not only the model performed, but also how our final uh, UPSAI product performed. And so I wanna, um, for those of you who have similar questions, I uh, would ask you to, to go ahead and look at the, um, the model. I can just tell you it performed well, uh, but there's, a, there's some nuance to, to that. Um, and if you do read the paper and you have some questions or you have some uh, comments or helpful suggestions, please uh, uh, email those to myself and uh, we will, uh, use that to improve our, uh, wor our working paper. Uh, last question here, when is the 2019 American Housing Survey data going to be released? Uh, and, um, the, the survey, the AHS is uh, um, you know, funded by HUD and administered by the Census Bureau, so we're working together to get that data ready for publication. And uh, we're hoping by the end, of the, sem uh, the end of the summer or early fall for the first round of data in our uh, AHS uh, table creator. So uh, on behalf of HUD, uh, thank you for joining us for today's presentation on the neighborhood description questions in the 2017 American Housing Survey and the new products we've created from the data. We hope this information has given you some ideas about how you can use the American Housing Survey data to examine how households describe their neighborhood. 
These new products are just a few of the ways we are working to make the American Housing Survey data as easy as possible for you to use in your work. Thank you again for joining us.